This is VOA Africa. Good evening, I'm asked to give you a tips Friday, November 8th. This is Africa 54. Dozens are dead and scores missing near a Canadian-owned mine in Burkina Faso. Sierra Leone's president and first lady share the work they're doing to elevate the plight of women and girls in the country. And in our entertainment segment, a closer look at world music icon Salif Keita. We begin our broadcast in Burkina Faso where distraught families are urging authorities to allow them view the bodies of victims of an attack near a gold mine where dozens of workers were caught in an ambush Wednesday and many more remain unaccounted for on Friday. Lisa Bernard has more. At least 37 people are dead and 60 wounded after workers at a Canadian-owned mine in Burkina Faso were ambushed by gunmen. The worst such attack in years in a country plagued by jihadist violence. Quebec-based gold mining company Semafo said five of its buses, with a military escort, came under fire on the road leading to a mine in the eastern part of the country. Friends and relatives waited outside a local hospital for news of their loved ones, including a pastor whose brother is among those wounded. He told me that the bullet hit his leg and he fell to the floor. Then others came above him and there were more and more shots. Because the others were on top and he was underneath, God protected him. He got two bullets in the legs and his toes as well. The assailant's identity is unclear, but parts of Burkina Faso are struggling to combat surging Islamist violence with several people displaced from their homes. The country's president lamented the attack in a televised address. Une fois de plus. Once again, our people are in mourning because of terrorist groups that are multiplying and carrying out murderous actions against our civilians, our defense force, and security forces. Semafo tightened security at its mine last year following attacks that killed three workers and five security officials. Last year, African forces took part in a U.S.-led counterterrorism training program in Burkina Faso as part of an annual military exercise for West African nations. Lisa Bernard of Reuters reporting. Sierra Leone's president and first lady are working together to elevate the plight of women and girls in the West African nation. VOS Peter Claudi sat down with both the president and first lady for an interview in New York recently. Salem Solomon has this story. Sierra Leone's president, Julius Maida Bayo, made international headlines when he declared rape and sexual violence and national emergency earlier this year. On this note, ladies and gentlemen, I therefore declare rape and sexual violence as national emergency. Bio said he sees improving the lives of women as a key way for the country to develop economically and in terms of health indicators. I believe that uh, if we have to develop as a nation, Sierra Leone, and the world at large, where women are in the majority, we must treat them fairly, we must take them seriously, and we must make them a part and parcel of the sustainable development goals, making sure that they are made to be productive and be part of um, uh, the, the match towards sustainable development goals. In 2018, the rape of a five-year-old girl in Sierra Leone by her uncle that left her paralyzed generated outrage and calls for stricter laws. The same year, instances of reported sexual violence rose to 8,505, an all-time high. According to the Rainbow Initiative, a Sierra Leonean organization that helps survivors of gender-based violence, 93% of victims treated are younger than 17 years of age and 24% are younger than 11. Historically, most attackers go unpunished. Bayo said he's determined to change that. We are going to make sure that um, this fight is taken very seriously. I must say that I was appalled by the nature of what I met. 
uh, women we are not taking seriously, girls and little babies we are being raped with impunity. Bayo said his administration is now taking drastic action against those who commit rape. In September, the country's legislature amended its Sexual Offenses Act to allow a maximum punishment of life in prison for someone who rapes a child. The country has also created a Sexual Offenses Division of the High Court in order to hear sexual assault cases and increase rates of prosecution. First Lady Fatma Bayo has spearheaded the Hands of Our Girls campaign, which seeks to not only end gender-based violence, but address issues including teen pregnancy, child trafficking, child marriage and prostitution. At an event during the UN General Assembly, she was joined by other First Ladies from across the continent, as well as African Development Bank, including President Akinwemi Adisena. The Hands of Our Girl campaign is a campaign that I believe should be a global campaign, should not be limited just within Sierra Leone. And uh, we have worked very hard to a point where the title itself is, has a life of its own and uh, it's basically traveling like wa wildfire around the world. During the UN event, Fatma Bayo shared personal details about her life, including the fact that she was forced to flee an arranged marriage with a much older man in her early teens. From that moment, I vowed that I would not see a child being abused, she said. The First Lady sees the movement spreading. In neighboring Liberia, First Lady Claire Wea has launched the She Is You campaign to elevate women's rights and fight against gender-based violence. Now, the conversation about rape has begun in West Africa. Fatma Bayo believes it will only continue. What we have done um, um, as a country is actually introduce the subject. Early marriage rape is a subject that people don't like to talk about in Africa. People like to cover, they use a lead to cover it. And we have actually lifted that lead on it. With Peter Claudie, I'm Salim Salomon, VOA News, Washington. Very inspiring story there. Now, South Sudan's president and former rebel leader agreed on Thursday to delay forming a unity government for 100 days beyond the November 12 deadline, thus buying time after concerns that war could resume if the two sides were pushed. South Sudanese President Salva Kiir and opposition leader Riek Machar met in Uganda in a last-ditch effort to resolve outstanding disputes that were preventing the formation of a coalition government in time for the deadline. The two signed a peace deal in September 2018 under pressure from the United Nations, the U.S. and regional governments to end a five-year civil war that devastated the country. Each side blames the other for not meeting milestones stipulated by the peace deal, especially the integration of different fighting forces. Now, as the oil-producing South Sudan became an independent country in 2011, but plunged into civil war in 2013 after Keir sacked Machar as vice president, the conflict killed an estimated 400,000 people, triggering a famine and creating Africa's biggest refugee crisis since the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. Staying in South Sudan, it's a country that is slowly stabilizing after decades of conflict. The world's youngest nation continues to fight a battle against illiteracy. South Sudan has the lowest literacy rate in the world. Just 27% of the adult population can read and write. To combat the problem, authorities have launched thousands of adult education centers across the country. Sheila Pony reports from Juba. 47-year-old Rebecca Nyankir Deng is studying with her 17-year-old daughter. But while most mothers help their child to study, Deng has been illiterate for most of her life. So her daughter is helping her learn to read and write. My mother has now learned a lot of English words, such as greetings, and that makes me happy. If I come home early, I help my mom do her homework. Lacking an education, Deng makes and sells beaded jewelry to earn money. But it is so little that she struggles to buy food and pay her daughter's school fees. So Deng is now getting an education with her daughter. We're studying here because they're teaching us for free. If I had to pay for school, I wouldn't be here. 
Deng is one of a growing number of South Sudanese who see current peace as a chance to pursue education. After decades of conflict, barely one quarter of South Sudanese adults can read and write. That number drops to only 18% for women. South Sudan's Minister of Education says literacy for adults is a top priority because it helps pull people out of poverty and prevents conflict. At the individual level, at the level of a community, at the level of a country, with communities that have a lot of educated people, they will all be working, they will all be you know, enjoying better health, they will be more peaceful compared to people who are illiterate. The Education Ministry tells Voice of America just over 208,000 South Sudanese adults are now enrolled in programs to learn how to read and write. And as long as the current peace in South Sudan holds, they expect those numbers to only grow. Sheila Aponi for VOA News, Juba. Among the political newcomers who were elected to office in U.S. elections this week is 23-year-old university student Nadia Mohammed. The Somali-American won a seat on the city council of St. Louis Park in the Midwest state of Minnesota. She told supporters that her win shows that anything is possible. After years of years of being told you are not it, you will wake up every day believing that you are not it. And sometimes it just takes one person, one person to tell you you are it. So I also want to take out, I mean, I want to take time today to tell every single one of you guys that you are it, right? If you, whatever that success means to you, if it, if this proved that everybody can be successful, I want that, I want you to take that home and apply it to whatever that you want to do. Thank you. Mohammed came to the United States from Somalia when she was 10 years old and spoke little English. The new councilwoman graduates from Minnesota's Metro State University next month. It is my greatest honor to serve the people of St. Louis Park and in, in whatever they envision their city to be. I want to be your voice. I want to build a city that works for all of us. Regardless of what you are, who you are, what you stand for, I want the city of St. Louis Park to work for you. So thank you so much. It is my great pleasure. Mohammed won nearly two-thirds of the vote in this western suburb of Minneapolis and told VOA's Maksamud Maskade that she brings a fresh perspective to local politics. I think people saw my authenticity and my uh, my youth as a as a as an upside. You know, um, they you know like if you look at the city council right now, they're all uh, uh, they're well into their careers. They're well established. They need somebody who is new to the city council and can bring new ideas. Minnesota is home to the largest Somali community in the United States. Voters there sent Somali-American Ilhan Omar to Washington in 2018. She is one of the first Muslim women to serve in Congress. Now other African immigrants who won various elective seats include Girme Zahile, 32, a son of Ethiopian refugees who won the council seat in metropolitan King County in Seattle. Safiya Khalid, a 23-year-old Somali immigrant who won the Lewiston City Council seat in Maine, and one of the lost boys from South Sudan, Chol Majok, 34, who was elected to the Common Council in Syracuse, New York. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're streaming our show live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voafrica.com. Still to come, world music icon Salif Keita. We'll be right back.
I am Sheikh Asali, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. Could be French, English, Portuguese, Bantu, Arabic. It is the beat, the African beat that counts. The beat does all the translations. It cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat. It is so distinct and adhesive. It binds us together. African beat on the Voice of America. For more information, visit our website at www.voanews.com/africanbeat. I'm Clara Frank, and here's what's trending. Tourists are looking to travel to more obscure destinations for their holidays in 2020, according to the World Travel Market in London. The enthusiasm for more unconventional experiences is being buoyed by countries such as Saudi Arabia opening their doors to non-religious tourists. Another country keen to break out as a must-see is Ethiopia. And like Saudi Arabia, it's trying to simplify its visa process. Travelers can now get a visa in five minutes online or on arrival. Next up, the need to carry cash or credit cards is becoming less necessary in China, as the world's most populous country moves increasingly towards the future with electronic payments made via smartphones. The trend towards a cashless society has grown thanks to the wide availability of sales points and services, which accept payments through mobile devices and online apps. In 2018, over 40 percent of people in China used their mobile to make purchases, as opposed to just 20 percent in the United States. So, and finally, vets are setting up parks around Australia in a program offering treatment for the pets of homeless people. The charity is particularly busy in Hobart, where rental prices are soaring and landlords often refuse permission for animals to live on their properties. Anyone who is homeless or at risk of homelessness can have their pet treated for free. The free clinic started a decade ago in Western Sydney when a vet set up a table at a park in Parramatta. Since the Hobart Clinic started last year, it has treated 138 dogs and 50 cats. And that's what's trending today. In other world news, this Friday, November 8th, marks the third anniversary of Donald Trump's 2016 election as the 45th president of the United States. Trump remains a force of nature in American politics, but the third anniversary of his rise to power comes at a time when he is facing the gravest threat yet to his presidency. An impeachment inquiry led by the congressional Democrats over his efforts to pressure Ukraine to investigate political rival Joe Biden. VOA national correspondent Jim Malone has more from Washington. Three years have passed since that November night when Donald Trump shocked the world with his election as the nation's 45th president. To all Republicans and Democrats and independents across this nation, I say it is time for us to come together as one united people that early appeal for unity faded long ago but the more america achieves the more hateful and enraged these crazy democrats become trump is now counting on his loyal base of supporters to first withstand impeachment and then carry him to re-election next year at stake in this fight is the survival of American democracy itself. Don't kid yourself. That's what they want. They are destroying this country, but we will never let it happen, not even close. The impeachment probe in the House is focused on Trump's alleged efforts to pressure Ukraine to investigate political rival Joe Biden. Biden has made Trump the issue in his bid to win the Democratic Party's presidential nomination next year. He talks about there will be a civil war 
This is the guy that's unhinged. He is unhinged. I worry about what he's going to do, not about me or my family. I worry about what he'll do in the next year in the presidency. Like so much in Trump's presidency, the impeachment inquiry is playing out along party lines, says analyst John Fortier. For Democrats, they believe the president has done something wrong and they think they're going to bring out more evidence. And I think their hope is that that will turn public opinion against the president, perhaps allow him to be removed. Uh, Republicans, I think, are looking at past precedent to say this could be something that backfires on Democrats or at least doesn't catch fire. Polls show Trump's approval rating at just above 40 percent, historically weak for an incumbent president trying to fight off impeachment and seeking re-election at the same time. But underestimating Trump's hold on his political base is dangerous, says Republican strategist John Fury. Are the Washington pundits, is everyone inside the Beltway missing about Trump? Absolutely. They, they don't have any clue this guy's real appeal at, at a visceral level. But one of the reasons why they support him is because he keeps his promises and uh, he's got the economy going. Even if Trump is eventually impeached by the democratically controlled House, he would likely survive an impeachment Senator trial in the Republican-controlled Senate, says analyst William Galston. I have believed since the very beginning uh, of impeachment talk, which, you know, which started up more than a year ago, uh, that if the Democrats are to remove President Trump from office, it will have to be through the electoral process in 2020. Nothing that I've seen so far uh, inclines me to change my mind in the slightest. Three years into the tumultuous presidency of Donald Trump, Americans are now girding themselves for the prospect of both a partisan battle over impeachment and perhaps the most fiercely contested election in recent memory. Jim Malone, VOA News, Washington. You know it's Friday and we have a special for you in our entertainment segment, Salif Keita. He is known as Afropop singer, songwriter from Mali and as the golden voice of Africa, but also because of he has urbanism. Kater visited the Voice of America studios earlier this week and sat down with Music Time in Africa host Heather Maxwell to talk about his music and some of his struggles as a person with albinism. Let's take a listen. Hello everybody, I'm Heather Maxwell. Salif Keita is an icon of African and of world music. He hails from Mali. <laughs> He's also a symbol of hope for people with albinism. At age 70, the golden voice of Africa, as he is known worldwide, has released 20 albums. He has won four Grammy Awards for Best World Music Albums. And he's in the studio right next to me. I am so honored to present to you Salif Keita. Bonjour, Salif. Bonjour. How are you? I'm okay. <laughs> Ça va très bien. I'm so happy to have you in the studio. Uh, merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Um, your most recent and, uh, you say, last album, Un Autre Blanc, mm -hmm. is beautiful. And I love the song, Tonton. Can you explain to us what the song is about? The way things normally go, married women refer to their husbands as tonton, uncle. It's a term of endearment, so I talked a little about that. What happens between husband and wife? Merci. I love it. Merci. <laughs> also, uh, you know, like I said earlier, I remember you and mm. your music from mm. way back in 19... 89 in 1990 i was a peace corps volunteer in mali mm -hmm. Je te la paix. Mm -hmm. one of the songs i really loved back then mm -hmm. was one called koyan koyan ah, oui. koyan let's listen to a little bit of that and tell me what is koyan about mm -hmm. koyan yeah see uh, it's a past quelque chose koyan is about well something is happening that's very contradictory I say the more people there are in the mosque, the less Muslims there are in the mosque. 
I say that it's not because people go to the mosque that they are Muslims. No, on the contrary, they come to be seen, but they are not all true Muslims. Se montrer, mais ils sont pas des vrais musulmans. I would like it if you could explain briefly the obstacles that you had to overcome when in the 1970s when you were a young kid to do music. Vous avez vous avez eu des, des obstacles aussi. Beaucoup de Many obstacles. Yes. Many obstacles because people don't understand how you can be white with a black dad and mom. They don't understand that it's a problem of depigmentation. That it's a problem of melanin that makes someone this way. They don't know. They don't have an explanation for that. And since they don't have an explanation for that, there are all kinds of translations, all kinds of traditions that really prevent albinos from having a good life. They are tortured, discriminated against. I did a song, The Difference, for albinos. One last question. I would like it, Salif, if you could sum up mm -hmm. what you think the music can do good in the world for the young people who are now wanting to become musicians. You have to talk about what's happening. An artist has to affirm him or herself according to the problems in Africa. Africa needs to be known. Africa needs to affirm herself. Africa needs to talk. Africa needs people who will talk about her so that she gets out of anonymity, that she gets out of silence, and to make known what kinds of problems Africa goes through. We need artists to do that. And I think a lot of people agree with me that Africa counts on these artists to be known and affirm herself. Merci, Salif. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. What a great program, Heather. Thank you so much. Salif Keda, not just a golden voice for Africa, but also a mentor in Mali and also for the rest of the continent. Heather, thank you so much for that package. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a very great weekend. Thank you. Come on over.